Hey friends, hope you're doing well. Since I started this thing, part of the whole thing has been saying the quiet part out loud. That's why it's called plain spoke, and I'm hopefully not holding any punches. Uh, hopefully I'm, I'm talking about what's true, not afraid of the consequences. And of course you can go too far with that, but of course I started this because I thought not enough people were speaking plainly about what's going on, and so that's what I'm always attempting to do. There's a, an article that came out just recently. You should see it on the screen here. It's from the Religion News Service, and it sums up a survey of 1,200 United Methodist clergy found that half have trouble sleeping, a third feel depressed and isolated, half are obese, and three-quarters are worried about money. So I'm going to talk about this, and it's partly because it's my beat. The United Methodist Church is something that I exited uh, out of the intention of talking honestly about. I didn't think I could do it honestly from within. I'm now in leadership, uh, I guess middle management within the Global Methodist Church. But I'm talking about this not just out of the Methodist interest, but as I'm going to show here in a bit, this concerns a lot more than the United Methodist Church. This concerns clergy in America and America more broadly. So we're going to start small and then get uh, bigger as what we're talking about. It. This is going to be one of the most offensive episodes that I've ever done, and by that I mean a ton of people are going to find content that I share here, analysis that I share here offensive, and I'm going to offer it anyway, not because I just love offending people, but because I think people need to question their presuppositions here. As we continue to see the rotten fruit of Western civilization, I think it's incumbent upon us to return, uh, uh, repent, go back, because things are not going well. And I'm, I'm going to harp on that this entire time. So if you want to continue on in the delusion that everything's basically okay, then go to another video. If you want to see how all this fits together uh, in some interlocking pieces where the church is uniquely the solution to these problems. This is not a solu This is not a problem contained only to the church, but this is a sickness of the world that has very much infected the church. If you want to understand this problem so as to have ideas with me as to what needs to happen and how it is that church is uniquely called to directly address this, then you might consider staying with me for a little bit. If you're not really interested in the big picture thing, you're just interested in the small story of the United Methodist Church, then you'll enjoy the first half of this and then you'll kind of uh, you know, <laughs> stop watching at some point. So anyway, I'm going to direct you back to my screen here. We're going to look at, there was a starting article, and then here's the article. Um, yeah, there was the Twitter post, and then this is the article that it links to, and of course I'm going to have the URL uh, for you in the show notes if you want to check these things out directly. But the title is, The United Methodist Pastors Feel Worse and Worry More Than a Decade Ago. And then the subheading is half have trouble sleeping. Uh, we already saw this. A third feel depressed and isolated. Half are obese. And three quarters are worried about money, according to a new study. So I'm going to try and hold on to this. Sleeping, depression, alienation, isolation, obesity, uh, and financial issues. These are all significant things. And then you can listen to the article, and it gives uh, a breakdown on all these different takeaways from it. But it's referencing a study just put out by Westpath, and I pulled up the actual study. So I thought maybe we could just look through some of this together. Now, before we do this, I wanted to highlight um, a tweet by Stephen Fife. You know, I enjoy him. He, he does a good job on Twitter. I think he's, he's helpful. So um, you'll see that here we have the, the news article referenced, and then some guy named Chris, I don't know who Chris is, he, he says, I can relate. But since I've been out of the United Methodist Church, I have slept like a baby. So many less worries over here in the Global Methodist Church. I know the DS isn't going to call my family to move tomorrow. I can trust my leaders. My leaders have my back when I preach the Bible. And then Fife says, agreed. I talked to a former UMC clergy person today. He said it's like getting over PTSD. He's having to catch himself from worrying about the DS calling from what form he has to submit and when, or trying to hold his tongue in meetings. It was so toxic. So, of course, this is something that I identify with as well. I agree that the United Methodist Church is a very toxic environment. I'm very glad to be free of them. Um, for now, I've, I've gotten a lot of peace since I've departed. Um, but I think it's worth asking, is this something that the United Methodist Church is uniquely uh, responsible for, or is this something that is endemic to the whole culture that we're in. 
So uh, I'm going to say both. I'm going to say that the United Methodist Church is exceptionally toxic, but I'm also going to say that this is something impacting American Christianity, Christianity across the West. And now as we're exporting our, our particular sickness around the world, it's even infecting places uh, in Africa and South America and around the world. This is just something that we cannot run from. It's something that we have to lean into and do well. The only other option is succumbing to the forces of darkness in the world, which of course is is not an option. So let's let's look at this study. It's called the 2023 Clergy Wellbeing Study uh, Survey Highlights. So it's not even the full survey. It's just highlights. So here's the overview page. The, the well-being of UM clergy affects the entire connection, including the families, congregations, and communities they serve. So I would agree with that. Everything is, is interconnected. The second point is West Path supports well-being with a focus on five dimensions of physical, emotional, spiritual, social, and financial well-being. And of course, we've already seen these things are in crisis. The reason West Path cares, West Path is the agency that the United Methodist Church uses for all of their money investments including pension and retirement, but also health insurance. They, they run the gamut, and they have assets in the billions of dollars. So uh, they, they, they have health insurance investment, and so that's why they're studying this stuff. They have these programs very much designed for clergy well-being and health. I've been a part of these programs in the past um, where they, they, they're regularly checking in and encouraging you. And one irony that I'll highlight about this, as I will also highlight about mental health, is the more attention we put on it, the worse people seem to be doing at it. So this is one of those things where we need to ask the question of, are, would it be even worse if they weren't talking about it? Or is there some kind of strange incentive thing going on here, whereas we uh, continually harp on and focus on unhealth and try and exercise sympathy and um, um, affirmation with it that we perversely incentivize unhealth. And by the way, I framed that. You can tell this is going to be one of the offensive things I have to offer. So let's go back to the report. Overview uh, says this was launched in 2012. This is a biennial survey providing meaningful feedback on the current state of clergy. And so now it has 10 years of data. So it's going to compare current um, clergy well-being and health with 10 years ago. And so the next slide says there is a decline in overall perceived well-being in 10-year trends. So it tracks out 2013 to 2033, and you notice these uh, portions uh, get worse over time. The red increases, the green decreases, and um, so there's Let's see, that one is overall well-being over a 10-year tra uh, trend. Then you have the impact of the pandemic on well-being. Of course, it's very difficult to ascertain that, so I'm not sure how accurate this can be, but the, the pandemic seems to have played quite a role. Um, there's a spiritual dimension, uh, which I think that says, yeah, they have improved, which is interesting because I believe everything is interconnected usually. Although, you know, this makes me think of um, United Methodist Metrics. They had these five vital indicators that they were looking at, and four were declining, and the only one that inclined was Christian mission. And I think that that uh, created this dynamic where because one was growing healthy out of sync with the others, it was actually exacerbating those things. So as the United Methodist Church continues to focus on mission, uh, it, it causes all these other things to even get exacerbated and worse. Here, it says that our clergy, the United Methodist clergy, are doing better. They, they feel great when conducting pastoral visitations, participating in church-related events. 78% they have a vital relationship with God. They feel God's grace and God's love as they are. One of the questions I'm going to raise about this is how much of this is because they actually are spiritually healthy, and then how much of it is because they're medicated. And one of the things, you know, I, if I had had more time to prepare for this, I would have looked up stats on American uh, pharmaceutical consumption. But uh, when we're talking about mental health, we're not just talking about therapy. We're, we're talking about a massive number of people, pr proportion of people in the United States that are taking pharmaceutical interventions for how they're feeling or they're self-medicating with um, uh, marijuana or, or other medications. These are things that very much have feel, uh, implications for how we feel, whether or not they correspond with reality. 
going back to the study, it has a 10-year uh, look back. There's a less dramatic decline than other dimensions of well-being in spiritual dimensions. Um, and over the past 10 years, the greatest decline is in the statements, I feel a sense of harmony in myself, and I feel peaceful. Now, the harmony thing I would focus on is I think in the United Methodist Church and in America more broadly, we have... Um, drunk in some presuppositions in the out of the well water that don't conform to reality. So we have this highly synthetic culture that we're living in, synthetic materials, synthetic foods, synth synthetic clothing, synthetic notions of gender, sexuality, identity. All of these things are are not natural, not found in nature. They don't conform to nature. They're doing these notions are doing better than any time they've ever been tested before because we have higher uh, uh, technological refinement, because we're more separated from nature than we've ever been. But it creates this, this sense of disunity in the self whenever an individual is believing in things that are not true, that do not conform with the real world. And whenever you find a culture that doesn't even believe in truth, that says there's only your truth and my truth, well, that is going to disrupt a sense of harmony within yourself, because if there is nothing true, then why any of this? Um, it's all dependent on feelings, and feelings fluctuate and change, and so it's a meaningless way of life. The only way to rightly feel whenever you've drunk the Kool-Aid is depressed and alienated because there's nothing uniting us. All right, back into this study. The physical dimension, uh, we have terrible rates of ob ob uh, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. This, of course, is the leading cause of death in the United States, and increasingly around the world, these things are increasing. One thing it doesn't talk about, uh, I, it, I guess I'm just going to do my commentary throughout. Um, you know, before I do that, I had a scripture I wanted us to look at. So um, let's go to, what is it, Luke chapter 4, verses 23 through 30. Here's what... Uh, Jesus said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all of those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him over the cliff. And passing through the midst of them, he went his way. So what does the scripture have to do with what we're doing right now? It begins with them talking about bodily health and quoting this saying, physician, heal thyself. And then he says, essentially, I'm not going to bless you guys the way you want me to. And he talks about two different anecdotes in the Old Testament where the Israelites felt entitled to God's attention, and yet he instead gave it to Gentiles, Naaman and uh, the widow in Zarephath. So um, all this to say, we want preachers to tell us that we're doing things right, but it's a preacher's job to tell us when we're doing things wrong. A quote I see passed around and often repost is, good preaching will either make a person hate their sin and themselves or hate the pastor. And so depending on who you are and where you are in life, you either already know something's wrong and you need to hear someone talk about it, or you think that things are right and it would just be okay if it weren't for these nasty people ruining it. So with respect to the United Methodist Church, um, there, there are two different ways of looking at, well, probably more than two, but Stephen Fife is one saying, uh, yeah, they're miserable. Yeah, they're unhealthy because it's an unhealthy system, and that's the kind of people that it makes. And that's mostly true. There's also going to be something referenced at the end of this study, and I've seen people on Twitter already responding. We're not unhealthy. The only reason we're upset is because you guys keep slandering us and leaving. So this whole disaffili— we'd be fine if y'all weren't disaffiliating, if you would just get with the plan— so, and this is the, the thing that liberals of every generation say, uh, hey, it would all work out if you guys would just stop arguing and get on board, which of course is, is an autocratic tendency 
that serves centralization of power and um, taking of rights away from individuals. And if they ever got away with it, which they never do. Well, you would you could look at like say Marxist revolutions that have taken over countries as being mostly successful. And what you find every single time is massive wealth and or not wealth, uh, <laughs> poverty and death and misery. So these are things that we refuse to learn from history. The United Methodist Church is not miserable because of people disaffiliating. Rather, it was already miserable. It's getting more miserable. Some people have the good sense to leave, but the problem I'm particularly concerned with is those who've had the good sense to leave do not necessarily have the good sense to know what those toxins were in the UMC that they then need to purge from the GMC. And then outside of us Methodists, there are a lot of people that have drunk the Kool-Aid of our cultural waters to one degree or another. Most American churches are not a reflection of what you find in the Bible, and they need to have a better sense of what the unhealth is. What is the nastiness that that we need to, to not have in the church, that the world has in it? We, we created this notion that we lived in a Christian nation, right? And so we intentionally broke down the walls between American culture and the church that happens to be in America. And what that meant was that we no longer had the discernment for like a century, maybe a century and a half. We did not have the discernment to see the difference between what Christ preaches and what our country's doing. And that's not to say that everything America does is evil, but that is to say America is not the kingdom of God. And there's huge differences between an American worldly state and the kingdom of God. And there is the kingdom of God is what we're made for. It is the only healthy thing. It's the only holy thing. And then there are different states this side of heaven that do a better or worse job coming close to that. America once seemed to be driving towards that for a long time. It's been driving away from it now. And and we need to sober up about this. This this world, this country, is poisoning us. We are uniquely sick. We have we have pushed poison to the nth degree, and we like to imagine that God's favor is still upon us. And I don't know why we believe that, when the the signs of of spiritual poverty and death and decay are all around us. So let's let's get back to, into the study just to see a little bit more of this. I meant to, <laughs> I'm weaving this quite a bit. Let's, let's, okay, so this is the physical dimension. It's a 10 year look back. So over 10 years, we went from 40% obesity to 49% obesity. Diabetes, 12 to 14%. Pre diabetes, 9 to 14%. So these are diseases. I know that we live in the age of the body positivity movement, but this is, this is actually a lie. So, you're going to hear things, you've probably already heard things in our society like, this is just a genetic condition. Obesity and high, uh, diabetes, it's just a genetic condition. There's, there's nothing to be done. We just have to manage it. There is no way that's true. Genes do not change from generation to generation except very slowly in the process of mutation. We're talking about a population that went from single-digit uh, poverty, or not poverty, obesity, to uh, uh, 50% we're looking at almost. This is, this is abysmal, and it's because of our diet. That's, I, I took too much time getting there. It's because of diet, and then after that, lifestyle. We're, we're inactive and sedentary. We have been as a culture for a long time, but the new thing is we are eating garbage. It is not food. It is food-like products that taste delicious, but our bodies cannot handle them. And I'm sure you've, you've heard some kook saying that somewhere, but the American population is being poisoned by our food companies. We're owned by just a few companies that have consolidated it all under them. They pump it full of preservatives and sugars and things that you can't pronounce that your body cannot uh, metabolize. And so our bodies store these things, which uh, uh, results in inflammation and all kinds of health problems that directly happens to benefit the medical system, which then has pharmaceuticals that we then use to treat these things. So the food is making money off of you as they poison you. The hospitals and pharmaceutical companies are making money off you as they are treating these things that are becoming endemic to the culture around us. I know that sounds like a conspiracy theory, and it is. <laughs> I believe that forces have conspired against the American people to make money off of them, and they don't care about you and me. They care about our 
money. They don't care about our well-being. They love us being sick. They make more money off of us being sick. So as we continue to trust the people giving us food, giving us medicine, they say it's for our good. They, they put commercials on TV talking about how healthy they are. Well, what do we find? We're less and less healthy. Gee, what could cause this? I told you I'd offend you. Let's go back to the study. Um, emotional dimension. So uh, 10%, one in 10 clergy report suffering from depression. Can you imagine being depressed, like clinically depressed, and then convincing yourself that you have something to offer other people Jesus? I, and I don't want to cast, I don't want to be mean, but listen, if you're going to offer Christ to people, you need to have something that they don't. You need, to, you need to be able to cast a vision. And I'm not saying that if you have Jesus, you're not depressed. I think there are people that probably uh, are genuine believers and they are depressed. But I am saying if you are a believer and you're depressed, you probably should not be leading other people to Christ Jesus. Just like I think it's problematic whenever you are an addict and you're trying to lead another addict to sobriety. I, I just think there are certain signs of the fall. You know, like if I'm if I'm guilty of sexual sin, then I should not be in Christian ministry with people who have sexual sin. You know, I'm not going to be able to get them out of a place that I am myself. You know, Jesus said <laughs> that the Pharisees were blind leaders of the blind, right? That they, they 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 they're going to lead them into a pit, and that's what when you and this is what we're looking at with clergy generally. There are so many unhealthy clergy that they love Jesus and they see a bunch of sick people and they want to help, but they don't have that discernment to say. I'm not in a position to help. You know, this is this is what is killing people. Anytime I try and help uh, people that are in generational poverty, this is a this is a kind of lack of discernment that they have. They want to help everybody. They themselves are needing help. And so, what you've got is a bunch of if you apparently if you put crabs or lobsters into a bucket, uh, if you have just one, they can crawl their way out. But if you have more than one, anytime one tries to crawl their way out, the others grab them and and bring them down. And that's what's happening in the church now, is the church is called to be pure and holy, but then the people who are in the church who don't have interest in that, they start clawing each other down and saying, no, we're not called to be pure and holy. We're called to stay sin-sick and sorrow-worn and just comfort each other in that. The church, for many people, is not about expelling evil, expelling sin. It's about sin management. And that's a, those are two fundamentally different understandings of what the church is. So I wanted to talk about Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 32. There's a lot of scriptures that, that you can talk about, the purity of the body. But this, this, I think, directly impacts how we do church. Okay, so this is Paul. He's talking about marriage, but then he's using the church as a proof text for how marriage is supposed to be. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. Quote, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people in Christian ministry intentionally disregard this and many other scriptures. The body of Christ is supposed to be pure and holy and healthy. These are supposed to be markers of uh, people who are walking in Christ. There should not be, uh, that's not to say that you can't have the flu and be a Christian, or you can't be crippled and be a Christian, or can't have mental illness or a mental disability. These are things that are signs of the fall that Christ sometimes heals, and then is sometimes a thorn in the flesh because God's power is made great in our weakness. You know, this is, this is language from 2 Corinthians with Paul explaining his own uh, perpetual sickness or illness or, or curse. But the thing is, when we start acting as though those things really aren't a problem, whenever we em embrace uh, the, the body positivity movement or uh, the neurodiversity uh, movement, this is people that say that mental illness or mental disability isn't really bad 
these are just different ways of being and who's to say what's better and what's not, what's normal and what's not. These are ways that the world starts convincing us that the work of Jesus Christ is not necessary because the problem is just with us learning to be tolerant of each other. We just need to stop having that discernment between right and wrong, good and bad, suffering and pain, health and, and unhealth. If we just get rid of those notions, then we could all just be happy. That's, that's what is uh, being proposed to us. And then we simultaneously see mental health getting worse and bodily health getting worse. So let's look at a little more scripture, shall we? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For, quote, the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So yes, this is most directly and explicitly about sexual immorality, but it's about more than that. If our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, we have to treat our bodies right. And yes, Jesus said it doesn't matter what goes into the body, but what comes out. I do not think he was talking about diet. If you are feeding your body garbage, then of course you're going to feel like garbage. And if you're polluting your body, of course your spirit is likewise going to be polluted. So what we put in our bodies matters. And if you haven't ever looked into this, Weston A. Price was a guy 100, 150 years ago. He started traveling the world. He noticed that wherever Western diet hadn't come in yet, humans were generally healthier. We had better jaws, better nasal cavities. We slept better, and you notice that sleep was a part of this West Path study that, that people are not doing well in. They had better cardiovascular health. They had lower rates of, uh, much lower rates of, of cancer, of uh, obesity was pretty much not seen or heard of in the ancient world except for royalty. Um, these are all new phenomena associated with Western wealth and opulence and cultural rot, okay? So when we're talking about the relationship that we're supposed to have with our bodies, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and that does mean that we govern ourselves sexually. And I, I, I think I would be doing a disservice if I did not note that it is highly likely that a higher incidence of United Methodist clergy are sexually immoral than other clergy because, generally speaking, American United Methodist clergy don't think sexual immorality is a big deal. The scriptural perspective on sexuality, if you are a, a new believer or a non-believer and you're, you don't know what the scriptures say, the scriptural perspective on, on sex is that there are two kinds of sex. There is sex that doesn't offend God between a married man and woman, biological man, biological woman, that have made vows for life married to each other. There's, that's one kind of sex. And then there's everything else. It's porneia, sexual immorality. It's where we get pornography. Any sexual exercise outside of marital covenant bond is offensive to the Lord and bad for us spiritually. So the sexual revolution that began in the 1960s in, in America has been a massive failure as we have promoted um, um, sex without consequence, as we popularize not just the pill but abortion, as we've treated our bodies as just sexual instruments that are devoid of any moral implications. What we found is that people are sexually much more frustrated and miserable, and they're more miserable and alienated and depressed in general. These are things that to our minds, we go, hey, we'd all be happier if we could just do what we want and what makes sense to us, and who cares what's in the Bible. And what we find at every turn, at every stinking turn, is we are more miserable when we do whatever the Bible says is wrong. Just sit on that. Just chew on that. Even if I would like to think that there are United Methodist clergy who think I'm <laughs> theological wrong, theologically wrong, and they're just looking at this for, like, ammo to hate conservatives or something, but 
just go down the line of all the innovations that have taken place in our country over the last 100, 150 years, all the things of the past that we left behind, all these draconian notions of human sexuality and identity, and we're so more enlightened now. We're not any better. We're, we're worse. I, I think we're materially, technologically, obviously much better off at the expense of our physical health, our spiritual health, our mental health. We are not built for this. We are trying, if you believe that humans are just this tabula rasa, blank slate, we can be however we want. Through the coercive means of the state, we can reprogram people to operate in certain ways. Time and time again, history is showing us you're wrong. You're dead wrong. And you're causing all kinds of misery. And I don't care if you have good intentions. At this point, so much history has been written down. The signs are all around you. You are complicit in harming other people and harming yourself as you continue to preach these doctrines that lead to misery and death. So I had one other scripture I wanted us to look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Yeah, you notice there's a lot of uh, concern with, in 1 Corinthians, the nature of individual bodies and the corporate body. Okay, here's the quote. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And anyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. That means they don't give in to bodily passions. They don't do just whatever they feel like. That means they say no to themselves. They practice self-denial. They're temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. He's talking about salvation. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I wish I hadn't used the New King James Version there because the Greek there, and I think it has it in the NRSV and several others, says I box and beat my body into submission. You know, the, the notion is much harder. The proper relationship with your body we are not to be slaves to our bodies. Rather, our bodies are instruments, uh, containers of the Holy Spirit, and that means that we treat our bodies not the way that they tell us they want to be treated, but as God tells us they should be treated. And there's a big difference there. So we practice self-denial. So we, we practice mortification of the body, not, not necessarily beating ourselves or cutting ourselves, but denying ourselves. And we find that through fasting, through eating healthy food, through meditation, and through, through exercise, these, these things that humans have been doing for thousands of years and have done it very well under uh, the, the cross of Jesus Christ, these are things that we need for ourselves. Yes, it glorifies and pleases God, but this is a mutual relationship with us and Him. He is pleased when we are holy and healthy, and when we're holy and healthy, we are pleased in Him. But we have this alienation from self and others because we continue to pursue uh, goodness on our own terms, which of course was the original sin of Adam and Eve as they partook of that fruit that they should not have. We need to re recognize, we need to go back and return and realize that God knows what is better, better than we do. Let's, let's go back into the study now. I've been preaching for a bit and um, it's important for me to stop sometimes. So you have this um, 10% of clergy report suffering from depression, 35% report functional difficulties from depressive symptoms. So I think we're actually looking at a higher frequency of depression than the 10%. I think, I think we're actually, if it's impeding how you function, then you're depressed, man. Like, you, you need to get help. And the other offensive thing that I need to say today, I. I started looking a couple years ago for any kind of statistical sign that psychotherapy as helpful has made, and you will find people that swear by it. You will find anecdotal people saying, oh, I had therapy. It just, but I think that the whole notion of psychotherapy is fraught and causes spiritual sickness, even if it produces short-term uh, good feelings. And the reason is because you are engaging in a relationship that someone would not be in with you unless they were getting paid. Psychotherapy, the dynamic of it is that they are paid to listen to you, and that means that if they weren't getting paid, they wouldn't listen to you. That means they don't care about you. They're paid to care about you. I don't think that's healthy. What did people do before psychotherapy? Well, they turned to the church. 
And I'm not saying that, that they said a prayer and it all went away. I'm saying that people once upon a time <laughs> had to bear with one another in love. They had to deal with one another in the church. Nowadays, we leave one another. When someone offends us in the church, we leave and we get a therapist. We just pay someone else to listen to us and deal with us because those people at the church, they say things to me that make me uncomfortable or they offend me, you know. And I'm not saying that everything we say in the church is perfect. I'm sure tons of crappy, insensitive advice has been given over the years. But what we find when we bear with each other is we're not fragile creatures. We're actually quite resilient. And we can lean on one another and deal with each other's imperfections. And we're not these delicate little things that if you say the wrong thing, we'll go and kill ourselves. Increasingly, that is what people are because they've left robust communities like this and they've engaged in uh, financial relationships with people where they are paid not to offend. They act dispassionate or they're your constant cheerleader. That's not a functional relationship. I think the best relationship is gathering in the sight of Christ Jesus and working through this stuff together. And yes, I'm pointing towards the Wesleyan class meeting at this point. Accountability discipleship groups in your your small church, in your local church, you have to engage in those. That is where God requires us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And that has mental dimensions, that has spiritual dimensions, has physical dimensions. You know, we do this in my church, and there are people who are physically unhealthy that are bringing their lifestyles to the church and being corrected and saying, okay, yes, I know I need to stop drinking soda. Okay, yes, I realize I'm going to the hospital a lot, and I'm worried about sickness and death a lot. They're, they're, they're coming up against these things, and I'm not going to say it all works out itself immediately, but these are things that they're continually coming up to and saying, oh, this is really not good for me, and I need to stop this. Let's get back into the study, and I'll say more offensive things. Um, the emotional dimension, most measures of perceived stress remain at concerning levels similar to 2021. 42% feel things are not going their way. Yeah, that, that happens when you go against truth and reality. 39% feel they're not able to control irritations in their life. Well, welcome to adulting. Although if, that, if they're saying you can't control themselves, then okay, that's a problem. You need to learn self-control. Verse 35, they don't feel on top of things. Once again, welcome to adulting. Verse uh, uh, 25% say they feel nervous and stressed. Okay. Um, two measures of depressive symptoms are worse than 2021, 20, and the rest remain at concerning level. 69% feel tired or have little energy. Okay, so that directly corresponds with lifestyle and appetite um, and spiritual unhealth. 44% say they have a poor appetite or overeating. I've already, I, I hope I've talked enough about that. I mean, it's a real issue, and, um, you know, we want some kind of fix. We want like a pill or we want a surgical operation. But really, I mean, good old-fashioned self-control is quite a thing. I know that sounds very insensitive to a lot of people, and I'm not going to pretend to be perfect. I, I, I don't always have self-control perfectly, but I, when I lose self-control, I can't get defensive and say, how dare you? I try so hard. I'm weak. I fall. I have to get back up. The answer is not taking a pill or a quick fix. It's building that musculature so you're stronger over time. I'll lose all my subscribers today. 52% say they have trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. Okay, so that one I haven't talked much about, but sleep, okay, alcohol intake affects your sleep big time. So does looking at screens. So is staying up too late, you know. Uh, so is if you're not exercising, you know, your body has a balance that it needs to achieve. If people stop drinking alcohol... They went, they went down at a reasonable time. They didn't look at screens for a couple hours before they went down. If they exercised regularly during the day, um, and if they got plenty of sunlight, that has a lot to do with it as well. Do these five things, your sleep problems will mostly go away, unless you have small children, in which case there is nothing to be done about it, uh, I can say from personal experience, but I don't think that's what's going on here. Uh, we have a, a sleeping problem in this nation that is caused by largely these five things. All right, let's go back to the study. Emotional dimension, a 10-year look back. Um, so between over the last 10 years, people feeling tired or without energy has gone up from 59 to 69%. Uh, trouble sleeping, 40 to 52%. Poor appetite, 36 to 44%. Little interest or pleasure doing things, 23 to 35%. You know what that partly might be tied to is I've talked to a lot of people who take SSRIs 
uh, Prozac and antidepressants. And for a lot of people, it does create this uh, detachment from self, which they consider an upgrade because self is is not happy. Uh, but but I wonder how much of this little interest or pleasure in doing things that that sounds like there's ugh, that's not good. That that really worries me. Uh, feeling down, depressed, or having trouble concentrating went up from 19 to 32 percent. That's terrible. 28 um, percent reported not feeling understood by family and friends. We do happen to be living through one of the most, I've read several articles about people in their families cutting off other family members. And so the larger trend here, part of the toxic Kool-Aid that we're drinking in the West is, um, you know, in some ways we're way too tolerant of others, uh, but in other ways we're not tolerant enough. You, we cannot stand to be in relationship with people who vote differently than us, who have different uh, ethical frameworks than us, and so it's one thing to have people in the church who violate uh, the integrity of the covenant community. I'm very intolerant of that. But when we're talking about family, when we're talking about neighbors, when we're talking about coworkers, we're looking at an increasingly intolerant American population that's even caught in cutting off family and friends, increasingly narcissistic and self-absorbed. And of course, as you dive more into yourself, you become more isolated because you are not others. So true joy in relationship is found in being in relationship with others, understanding others, serving others. The more we get concerned with self, the more miserable we're going to become. Um, let's see, in 2013, 81% felt understood most of the time. That has gone down to 72%. Um, and then the people who hardly ever felt understood has gone up to 4%. So we, we've talked about that enough. A 33% feel lonely and isolated at work. Isn't that a shame? They're working for the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom of God breaking into the world. They're beating back the gates of hell. They're extending life and salvation to spiritual zombies. They're, they're literally saving souls or part of God's saving work in souls. And yet 30, a third feel lonely and isolated at work. That is evidence that, I mean, buddy, you're doing things wrong. If, if you are feeling lonely and isolated in your work serving the church of Jesus Christ, something is wrong. Something's got to change right now. You've either got to come in conformity with the scriptures in a way that you're holding off from, or you've got to reckon with the fact that you are not called to pastoral ministry. But you, if you are serving the church of Jesus Christ, you should not feel lonely and isolated doing that. You should feel connected. You should be connecting others. You should be understanding and understood. This is, this is appalling. I'm very concerned for people like this. 27% say um, few, uh, fewer full-time clergy are working 51 plus hours per week. I think that's a good thing. Oh, yeah, okay, so improvement from 2021 results. Okay, so I guess more people felt lonely and isolated at work in 2021. Well, yeah, okay. Um, and then, okay, so the, the downgrade is 33% uh, feel too many demands from the congregation. So this is the other thing I was going to talk about and offend people on. We're having fun today, aren't we? We live in America, which means that the, the, the customer is always right. And we've got a bunch of churches competing with each other to please people the most, which means we have a bunch of ear ticklers. We have a bunch of consumer-focused churches that want to please people, so they come in the door and give us a little bit of money. And if that comes at the expense of churches that give them bitter medicine, well, <laughs> so be it, you know. We can give them Jesus and some sugar, you know. Let's, how's that going? So um, when, when people are trained up in a few generations of the church— learning that they, the church wants them, the church needs them, um, they are consumers to be pleased, then they make all kinds of irrational, immature demands as they come into the body of Christ. They feel like it's the church's job to please them, to fill up their cup. When the opposite is actually the case is our first job as the church is, is to glorify God and, and take our joy in Him forever, and then to serve one another and have pour ourselves out for one another more than an eye to ourselves. And what we find as our uh, directionality is towards God and towards others is that we ourselves are, are satisfied because it is in giving that we receive, right? So uh, these, these 
twisted churches are dealing with twisted people who have twisted motives. They're not there because they identify as sinners in the hands of an angry God who hate their sin and self and want to turn from those things and walk in holiness and righteousness all their days. No, they think they're basically okay and that their sensibilities are basically right, and it's the church's job to appease them. And then you have people-pleasing pastors who don't have the integrity to make these people uncomfortable until they leave. So people like this, they, they have never until this point in history ever thrived in the church. But when it becomes normal in the church for people to complain, you know, what do the scriptures say about complaining and grumbling? It's bad. It's really bad. You know, it offended the Lord so much that he spent, sent venomous snakes to hurt and kill these people until Moses interceded. Complaining, murmuring is awful, and yet we tolerate it in the body of Christ. We intentionally uh, avoid conflict with people like that, and we intentionally try and please complainers and people bent on being negative and making demands, we have sowed our own destruction in the American church. It's because pastors lack that integrity. They've been so afraid of losing people in the pews that they don't even care that they've lost them spiritually and that they've now just got these um, obese hypertension spiritually. I, I'm using a metaphor here. These people have been feeding on sugar and milk all their life. They don't even know how to digest milk uh, meat at this point. We need pastors that maintain the standard of Christ and help people discern, hey, if I'm going to come here as a consumer and making demands and being nasty, I really don't belong in the church. You can't have... Pastors are not going to do this whenever their notion is everybody belongs in the pews. That, that, that anyone who wants to be here deserves to be here. Everyone deserves a, a, a voice and a vote in the church. Whenever you throw doctrine out the window, whenever the church is no longer a covenant community with people with shared convictions seeking the mind of Christ, whenever you just let everybody come in, then it becomes a sin to kick anybody out. It becomes a sin to make anybody uncomfortable, and you've caused your own misery because the kind of people it creates are the kind that are going to make you and other people miserable, and that's why other people leave your church, because it's full of miserable people and a miserable pastor. So we need to repent. <laughs> I don't know. Let's go back to the study. Uh, work-related stress, 10-year uh, look back. You know what? You can, you can look at the rest of the study yourself. I, I, I think I don't want this, this to go too long. Um, so a couple other things I'm going to focus on. Um, I, I think I've, I've beaten a dead horse against the United Methodist Church and the kind of cult, clergy culture it has, and I understand that there are individuals who are going to say, I'm not depressed and I'm happy and my church is thriving. I would say that they're an exception, first off, statistically, and then secondly, I think a lot of, of them are lying to themselves. And third, I think there are a lot of people who are in Satan's grasp who are perfectly happy and won't realize the misery that they and death they participated in until it's too late. So I'm not at all threatened by people's um, uh, anecdotal, personal accounts of doing just fine. Rather, there's, there's the Bible and its truth, and man, even if 100% of people said they were doing just fine, and they were going against the Bible, uh, the Bible's truth still stands. But even so, one of the things we happen to see is when a society generally goes against the Bible, that society is generally miserable. So um, I pulled up an article, and it's just one among thousands. It's something that's been known for a couple of years now. Liberals are less happy than conservatives. And that's not to say all liberals. This is making a generalization. It's something that people are arguing about. Uh, right now. Why is it? How could it be that liberals are more miserable than conservatives? Some people say, well, it's because they're more sober and their eyes are more opened, uh, and the world's a more miserable place, and we see it. Uh, that doesn't seem to correspond with reality at all. Um, there are people that have looked into that as a, a hypothesis. There doesn't seem to be any more evidence that, that liberals are more acutely aware of problems in the world. Um, there, there do seem to be some demographic realities, namely that older people uh, are generally happier, and that younger people, especially young women, are generally more miserable, and that maps on to the conservative-liberal divide. Now, that's not to say that conservatives are right about everything and liberals are wrong about it, everything. That is to say that these are dispositions and worldviews. Conservatives generally believe that people in the past had wisdom and figured out problems that we should trust their solutions to generally. 
liberals believe the opposite. They think that that there is no need to look to the past, that we are not bound to the lessons learned by those in the past, and people in the past were generally ignorant and wicked, and we should detach from them. So those worldviews map onto this happiness continuum pretty well. Um, and so I would say that that the rise of liberal Christianity, liberal culture, taking control of you know the long march through the institutions in America, I think this directly tracks with a rise in anxiety and depression. And what conservatives are largely anxious and depressed about largely has to do with whenever they come on board to the liberal project and adopt liberal presuppositions. So I, I actually think we are so ideologically and spiritually unhealthy in this cult, cult, country, we have virtually gotten rid of um, 90 percent of the causes of disease that killed ancient people, were more materially comfortable, but even though ancient peoples lived in abject misery and terror compared to us, I think they were actually happier than us. They weren't taking those statistical studies back then. But even so, we're particularly miserable, are we not? And I think it's it would be silly to imagine this is all just a chemical imbalance that's I mean, yeah, I think we are chemically imbalanced and hormonally because of plastics, microplastics in the water. And uh, if, yeah, if you haven't looked into that, that's upsetting. Pharmaceuticals in the groundwater that get in, get back into our uh, uh, drinking water. Yeah, we're manipulating ourselves, but that's not the only thing. The other thing is we have beliefs that are toxic and synthetic and depressing. And so a lot of times when we are depressed, it's because our lives are depressing. I would say... If I had to guess, and I, I know I'm not an expert in this, but I don't trust the experts in this, and that's part of the thing here. I think the vast majority of people who are depressed is because their lives are depressing. They're, they don't have a weird chemical imbalance in their brain. It, there's something that's off in their lives that needs correction. But the one thing they need for that correction, which is the Church of Jesus Christ, is one of the main things that they've written off is something in the past that is just not acceptable anymore. So they have closed the only door to them that can lead them to green pastures. Let's look at something else I pulled up. I don't even remember where I'm at right now. Okay, this was an article from 2022. Last year in the Deseret News, religious leaders struggle with burnout, depression, and anxiety just like the rest of America. So that's two things. First off, yes, United Methodist clergy are uniquely miserable, but all clergy in America generally are miserable. I would consider myself an exception. I am not miserable. I have served churches where I was miserable in the past. I, 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 I sing God's praises first, but I am very happy to serve the two little rural churches I'm at right now. They don't get offended by the word. They don't act with cruelty to me or my family. No, they're not perfect, but we are working, at our, working out our salvation together walking in the scriptures together, doing life together, it's an amazing thing. I have something resembling biblical churches. That's rare. Um, and, you know, people look at information like this and they go, man, we need to treat our, our pastors better. We need to have Pastor Appreciation Day, and we need to pay the pastor more money. Those things don't have an impact on a pastor. You know what does? One, if they know Jesus Christ and are in submission to the scriptures, first off. If your pastor is not there, there's nothing you can do for him or her. Secondly, if they have a church that is sold out to Jesus and following him in the way that historically and scripturally we know he wants. So if, if you have a bunch of unrepentant sinners in the pews, then of course the pastor is going to be uh, depressed because he's looking at how inept and impotent the word has been in, in that setting. And he's helping a bunch of people pretend that they're Christians when they're actually not. How, how is that not depressing? You know, But when you have a true church led by a true believing pastor, then not only is that not depressing, but it's like, I'm the most blessed person I know. I wish that's all we had. I mean, if that's, if that's the only kind of churches we had, full of people practicing self-denial, practicing uh, picking up their cross daily and following Jesus, spending their time during the day, not watching Netflix, not going to movies, not watching porn, not taking drugs, not uh, uh, playing video games, but just spending their, their lives pleasing God, seeking Him, hungering and thirsting for... That, 
to have a church like that would be, well, it is amazing. That's what we should have. But rather than looking at that and going, man, we should really get our churches together. We should really up the standards. Man, we, re- we need another Methodist revival to, to, to hold people's feet to the fire. We need another uh, Great Awakening. Nobody's, very few people are saying that. Most people are saying, well, we need to put more money in, in public education and mental health and, and, and restributive and restorative justice, and, and we have all these new things that as we continue to put more money in it, it ain't going well. Meanwhile, in our country just 100 years ago, people were generally not this miserable and they didn't have the social safety net, they didn't have mental health, they didn't have pharmaceuticals, and yeah, there were still individuals who were miserable, but we're talking about a big general picture here. At what point are we going to wake up and realize that, that we think we know what we're doing, but we don't actually know what we're doing? Just as a general reminder, the, the name of the show is Plain Spoken. Um, time is valuable, and I, I'd like to think I'm not wasting yours. Um, one other article, yeah, one other article. Pastors share top reasons they've considered quitting ministry in the past year. This was from Barna, who does a lot of these good studies. Um, so from 2021 to 2022, things got markedly worse. Have you given real serious consideration to quitting being in full-time ministry? 42% of clergy in the U.S. said yes. Why? 56% say the immense stress of the job. 43% say, I feel lonely and isolated. 38% say, current political divisions. 29% say, I'm unhappy with the effect this role has had on my family. Man, that's a real thing. 29% say, I'm not optimistic about the future of my church. And 29% say, my vision for the church conflicts with the church's direction. These are all real things, and I don't want to be too dismissive of any of them. But we have a culture right now that instead of solving problems, tries to learn to live with them. And people who do try and solve problems are regularly called intolerant or bigoted or ungracious. I I think it's time that we realize that our tolerance in these ways is causing great harm. Once upon a time, we had a a culture in a country that was generally Christian. People generally feared the Lord. They were not offended by talk of sin, hell, death, um, punishment. These were parts of the worldview that were just taken for granted. People worked hard. They did not feel entitled to society, bending around them, acknowledging them for who they thought they were. They were people who knew that life is short, death can come at any time, and that we have a good Savior who died on a cross for us. This is something that once we've jettisoned and we feel entitled to all the material blessings that we have, we feel entitled to health, wealth, and prosperity, you know, that's a false gospel. Whether it's inside of a church building or out, it's a false gospel. Life is, um, it's a blessing, but it's hard, and it's not made for fragile people. It's made for resilient people who can sober up and walk in the light. That's, That's who the church is for. And so, you know, I think this study is a wake-up call for a lot of people who've been asleep. They, they think maybe they're the only one who's miserable. No, you're, you're trying to make something work that doesn't work. It's a misery-producing situation. We are in a miserable culture, a uniquely miserable culture that Christ alone has the answer to. But for so many people, they have just said, Christ cannot be the answer. He will never be my answer. I refuse to believe in this God. And those people will be depressed for all their life and all eternity. And if if you don't learn to create these, these holy boundaries in your life, namely that of the, the boundary between the church and the world, then you will be miserable with them. They they, you know, when it, I was a, a life um, <laughs> lifeguard at one point, and what they teach you is if there's someone flailing in the water and you're trying to save them and they don't stop flailing, you have to let go of them because they will get you killed. You cannot save someone who will not submit. And so if we've got a proud generation, a narcissistic generation that will not submit to the rule of Christ, Christ is Lord whether or not they accept him or not. If they will not submit, then you can't help them. The church can't help them. We cannot bless them. We cannot make them comfortable. And in fact, to do those things is to sin against them because we're making them comfortable in their own death and despair. A final reflection, a tweet from my friend 
uh, met. He quotes from Le Leonard Ravenhill, the truth is that a minister who's going to not deny scripture should quit the ministry and go sell hamburgers. The reason that we're dealing with this problem in the church is because we thought we could augment the gospel. We thought that we could lower the standards of Christ. We thought that we could make an attractional church where people are drawn to something other than Christ and Him crucified. We thought that we could have a church that played nice with the world. Um, all of these things were lies. So we have to wake up, and if there are people who want to bend the scriptures so that the church doesn't have to be pure and holy, so that um, non-Christians, people who don't uh, observe the truth of the scriptures, people who are not in submission to Christ, so that they have a place in the church, I would say that they are denying scripture and inviting destruction, not just on their church, not just on themselves, but on the culture as a whole, because the whole point of the church is to be salt to the world. And if you don't know what that means, salt was a preservative in the ancient world. This world is going to hell. This, this world would fall apart if it were not for the church's continual prayers for it. But if the church loses its saltiness, if we lose the distinct flavor that, that Christ has put in us by, by dying to self and being born again in Christ, if we, if we lose that distinction, then we aren't the church, we aren't Christians, and we should go sell hamburgers. I love hamburgers, but hamburgers ain't Jesus. All right, um, I think that was all I had to share. There's probably a thousand other things that could be said. If I've offended you, I hope that that offense goes towards rethinking some of these things. I know I've said some things that sound crazy, and once upon a time I would have been incredulous at some of the things that I've said. I've largely gotten here by just watching and learning listening to some experts and then some normal people. And um, so I would just encourage you to do your own research. If anything I've said here is just obviously false, you may correct me in the right spirit. Anyone who's just out and out nasty, I'm not in this to make friends or get a big following. I'll just kick you off the, the page and that's all there will be to it. So anyway, as always, I am gonna invite your, your thoughts, whether they're uh, affirming or, or not and then just invite you to, to be a part of the project with me, even if you're not on board with all of it. I, if you want a true church in the future that's making a difference in the world, if you want to see a rigorous Christian faith in which we speak the truth in love, in which we hold to the blessings of the past and march boldly into the future, uh, unashamedly preaching Christ and Him crucified, then I would invite you to come on board with me in the Plain Spoken Project. Follow me on my different social media stuff. Give to this ministry if you can. Um, I'd like to to make a difference if I can. So God bless you for listening to me this whole time, and I'll, I'll see you next time.